When you buy an expensive piece of gear, the one thing you don't think about is the cables that connect them. So in today's What the Tech, we've got Dylan Nunez from Hosa Tech, the leading manufacturer of cables and connectors. And in this episode, you're going to learn why not all cables are made equal. Who's going to play at Dylan's funeral? And the top five stocking stuffers for the audio file in your life in this edition of What, what the, the tech. tech. Let's get into it. Dylan, uh, you know, not all cables are made equal. You know, Hosa offers just several different types of cables from the Edge series, the, you know, the Hosa Essentials, the Pro series, even Zayola. Um, can you kind of walk us through the differences of what all those different series are and why you guys came up with those? Uh, well, that's, there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, starting, I suppose, from the bottom, what we're known for, the essential or for a long time, what people just call standard, um, you know, it's entry level stuff. Usually it's plastic. Well, it's not usually, it's always, you know, outside of maybe guitar cables, like plastic molded end cables. Um, and it's really meant to be a budget friendly option that just kind of gets you in the door. Sometimes you don't have the money to spend. Sometimes people... I mean, when it comes to cables and accessories, that's usually not where you want to invest your top dollar, understandably. Yeah. So it kind of gets you in the door. And then uh, up from that, we go to Pro, which is uh, a significant upgrade across all of the components. So from the conductor that's inside of it to the shielding that's in each of the cables, um, it uses Rian connectors, uh, which are made by Neutrik. Um, and actually, all in all, the price jump from the essential to pro is is actually surprisingly really small to the point where most times i just tell people like it you it's worth spending the extra couple bucks to get a cable that's just going to give you so much more and it's going to be more reliable as well buy um, cheap buy twice that's what i always say <laughs> <laughs> true uh you know uh, and we're kind of unique in that, uh, and I'll, I'll get into the other stuff, but we're unique in that having that pro line is this sort of middle tier. Uh, there's not a lot of brands, especially cable brands that have a middle tier. So it's usually like your low grade stuff and then your kind of flagships. Um, so then from pro, we move up to edge and edge is um, sort of like the entire sort of specked out cable. You know, I hate to throw out, you know, other people's names and things like that. But, you know, when somebody thinks of something like Mogami, you know, it it's like kind of in that vein where you just have a very robust build uh, upgrades again across the board in the size of the conductor, um, the shielding, and they use genuine Neutra connectors, uh, which are gold plated as well, which helps protect a little bit more against uh, corrosion and things like that over time. Um, so that is actually a more significant jump and in investment, but the sound transparency and the um, capacitance, especially difference between edge and everything else uh, is pretty significant. So if you're that type of person who wants is willing to invest in order to get like the best thing that you can possibly get for your money. Uh, Edge is definitely uh, in that class. And we've been pretty proud of the fact that, you know, we offer a very comparable cable to that higher end, like the higher end boutique brands, but it's not at, you know, the significant as significant to cost as you would normally find. Uh, and then, we get into and not to get ahead of myself, but edge uh, only applies to uh, instrument, mic and speaker. So when it comes to like interconnects that you would use for like uh, plugging your interface into your studio monitors, you know, pro is as high as we go on those, but really pro is is about as good as you'll ever need for like, you know, line level signal and stuff like that. I, I would agree. I, I use like, pro um you know i always have a bunch of pro cables in my mix box for for doing live sound for interconnects like eighth inch to quarters or eighth to you know xlrs they're they're super robust and you know the mm -hmm. uh, edge series stuff we're actually using right here you can kind of see under my you know <laughs> great product placement but you know it's, it's they're awesome cables you know they are really built you know like mm -hmm. i don't want to say overbuilt but they are 
they're truly overbuilt, you know, compared to a lot of the competitors out there. So that's that's awesome. I think Hosa is like sort of the unsung hero of gear. It's like we spend all this time lusting after gear and preamps and guitars. And then we go to the store and we don't buy a nice cable to go with it. So um, make sure when you're when you're gear lusting, you're also lusting after gear that's going to have transparent sound like edge cables uh, from Hosa. So. Dylan, you're a marketing specialist, and one of my favorite, uh, I'll call it a bit that you do on your Instagram channel and YouTube channels is the 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 gear that got away, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, music musicians sharing a piece of gear they sold or traded or did something. So I wanted to ask you, is there any gear that got away from you? <sighs> I mean, I, I am a guitar player by trade, and I think as a guitar player, you can't help but constantly just shuffle through things because you, you want to have everything, but you, you can't have everything because you're a musician, so you, you, know, you can't afford much. Uh, but uh, I think back to like when I was a kid, I got the, the guitar that I wanted the most was a Jackson Rhodes V because I was a metal kid. Yeah. And uh, I got one for my birthday one year, but it had like it had some problems. So we took it back to a, like Guitar Center or I think Mars Music at the time was the place. Oh. If you remember that name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh and so they didn't have any other ones there. So they basically told us you can, we can either order you a new one and you can wait, or you can pick out a different guitar from the wall at equal value. I want it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I opted to take something right now. And I went home with uh, an Epiphone Flying V, which I won't take anything away from. I still love that guitar, but it never made me stop wanting a Jackson Rhodes to the point where I still think about that, like, even though I have no practical use for it anymore, <laughs> it's just the thing that you wanted. You had it for a second, you tasted it, and then it was gone. So yeah. that's that's probably it for me. But I was 14 at the time. I, was I mean, that young. is the epitome of the metal guitar. Yeah, you know, it like, really is. <laughs> it is iconic. So. It really is, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And Randy Rose is one of my uh, musical heroes as well, so it's like, it's both an awesome looking guitar and it's like a tribute to somebody who, who has like a, a big you, influence yeah. on you. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So Dylan community is going to sort of be a theme throughout this interview with you because Hosa is really one of the manufacturers that I think spends the most time with their own community, helping the community of artists. And there's multiple ways that we'll talk about, but one of them is, artist relations so some of my friends like sam pura a producer or fluff or um, all kinds of different musicians are part of the uh hosa family of artists are there any new artists that you've added to the roster that you're excited about right now uh yeah i mean always always looking out for people um as you can imagine with the uh everything that's happened this year with the pandemic it's it's been a weird year for artist relations because nobody's really out touring um people are still obviously making music and pushing stuff but uh it's just changed the the dynamic a lot and not only that but companies being unsure about like what their place is in the market you know, sort of pulling back on how much you're willing to invest uh, in different things. You know, thankfully we've uh, we've been doing you know well, and we've come you know out of this in a good place, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, and uh, but I, I think the last the last couple people that we sort of added to our uh, artist page. Um, would be actually two female artists, um, Sarah Longfield, who is from like Madison, a, Wisconsin. Oh, really? All yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm from Madison, so you know I will have to look nice, her up. Nice, nice, very nice. <laughs> yeah, she lives in uh, she lives in Minneapolis now, but she goes back all the time. That's where she nice. grew up. And obviously, I'm originally from Wisconsin as well, uh, Oconomowoc, southeastern, oh, nice, southeastern part of the state. So there is that like that scony 
connection that we that we uh, have and can bond over. Yes, at least but, you're smart and got out of the cold. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I still go back to it every year, though. So I haven't. Uh, I'm not that smart, but uh, it's good to but, visit, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. You go for like a week or two, and you go, "All right, that's that's enough," and then you fly back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, Sarah's Sarah's great, uh, fantastic guitar player, very unique. Uh, she does a lot of finger tapping stuff, almost like a piano. Uh, it's really, really cool, really shreddy stuff. Um, and she also does modular synthesizers as well. So she's gotten a lot more into like electronic music. Um, and I think the other last person that we added was uh, Adrian Cowan. She's a vocalist and a keyboardist. She has her own band, uh, Seven Spires, but she also plays in... Uh, wins a plague and she tours with the uh, like kind of operatic metal act uh, Avantasia for anybody who's familiar with that name. Um, but she's, you know, one of the, one of the newcomers, but somebody that I had seen a little bit online and just seemed like a good kind of fit for what Hosa does. Cause there's definitely a feel that I get for, I think people who, have that kind of like hunger and that kind of, I don't know, loyalty or appreciation or whatever. There's just something humanistic that you can tell in somebody whether or not they, you know, sure. fit in well with your own culture. And those are usually the people that I gravitate to, even if they're not the, the biggest artist out there, you know, it's just kind of like, Hey, you seem like you would, you would, we would work well together. You know, yeah, and bravo to you for not just picking all dudes in the basement with their guitar. <laughs> well, I will tell you, there's a lot of dudes in their basement with their guitars, so you can't help but pick up a whole bunch of those. But uh... yeah, yeah, no offense to those guys, but like yeah. you mentioning that the last two editions were female <laughs> artists mm -hmm. just makes me think like it's another example of how diverse Hosa is and how that you are really mm -hmm. focused on community, not just the biggest influencer, but somebody matches that matches the values that host attack carries. Yeah, absolutely. And in our building, we have, you know, we work in Southern California. So we have people from all walks of life that work in our building. And not only that, but our CEO, Mayumi is a woman as well. So powerful. It's, yes. you know, there, there's certainly no pretension uh, when it comes to Hosa or myself about, you know, trying to fit anything into a particular mold. I always, ju I just respect individuals, you know, like it doesn't matter where they come from or what they look like. You know, it's, you try and look at who they are just as individuals, as musicians, creators, that type of thing. I yeah. love that. That's great. Cool. Well, we can't keep this all business. So we're, we're going <laughs> to ask some fun, fun questions. So we, we've got uh, these these pod decks here. You know, some of these are you know, just interview questions. They're kind of fun to get to know the Dylan. We already know that he hails from the almighty Wisconsin, which is awesome. <laughs> we know he's got a red beard. So we, yeah. were, we were talking about that before. And he's we also on. got a cue ball. I know, so he's like, kind of <laughs> like if you put us together in, in a blender. You get Dylan. You get Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Dylan, the, the question for you, which band or artist dead or alive would you have play at your funeral maybe randy rhodes maybe what randy rhodes it? on the jackson roads flying yeah. <laughs> just shredding oh would i have played at my funeral so, so i mean ways you could go with that there are i mean are you talking about like a live performance of yeah. something this is the simulcast of standing, dylan's demise standing on your <laughs> casket <laughs> I would I would say, and this maybe would throw you for a loop, but I would say Aaron Copeland. I'm unfamiliar with Aaron yeah. Copeland. Aaron Copeland is a, a classical composer. He's okay. American, and he's kind of credited as being like one of the sort of shapers of the American sound that we uh, know. Uh, th there is probably a couple pieces of his that you've heard just in like media, but maybe okay. you don't know the name. But he has a particular way of making you feel nostalgic about something that you don't know what you're feeling nostalgic about. Like just the beautiful way of writing that always just makes me stop and 
listen and feel. And I feel like uh, if it's a funeral, it's um, very apropos for a funeral. It is. Yeah. He, Who he would, would play be... at your funeral? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> You know, Mr. Mix a lot. Mr. Mix. No, you know what? I would like the <laughs> band Gogo Bardello to play at my funeral because Ooh, that's a good one. It would be, you know, a time of rejoicing yeah. that Sean's gone. Or I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I think they would put on a good funeral. You know? Yeah, that's that's probably. The what best. about you? I'd go with like Trent Reznor, just like dark goth, <laughs> just like moody, just like covered in powder and <laughs> and you know just sweaty and just everyone's mad and it, it would be a, a really good time. So speaking. I love- of- how different all of our responses are yeah, from like know, beautiful crazy. classical to like crazy off the wall to like i want everybody to be depressed maybe we could start like a <laughs> festival called like funeral palooza yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna have to check out uh your guy because now i'm now i'm i'm, I'm intrigued. curious yeah so exactly I'll so some stuff yeah definitely so you know travis mentioned uh trent, trent Reznor, Reznor, yeah. which you know i always equate with synthesizers that's a really hard word to say so you know hosa's actually gotten into um the you know the analog synth market you know supporting them uh recently um with all the synth uh playground stuff um you know modular synth to me modular synth i don't understand it's kind of like um uh what's his name from sonic youth of like how do you get that tone with all those more yes with all those pedals like how can you repeat that live i've always wondered that with you know analog synth guys that perform live you know of remembering what an expensive habit those modular synths are oh my god for (laughs) real so (laughs) Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, you guys are, are really supporting it. You guys have really dived in, you know, delved into supporting that market. And it, it mm-hmm. seems like it's it's kind of wildly blowing up. There's like a ton of boutique companies and stuff. So kind of tell us a little bit more about like how you guys A, how you found your way to that market, I guess. Um, and you know, B some of the products that you guys have coming out. Yeah. Um, it started a few years ago when things were when things were kind of picking up steam, but it it hadn't really exploded the way that it it has the last, uh, you know, I would say maybe like two, three years, at least that I've noticed, you know, yeah. like I mentioned, I'm a guitar player. So that world is a little bit foreign to me outside of just what now I've been exposed to. Um, so, but we kind of got into it um, because uh, Jose, our uh, product, uh, I don't know what he would have been at the time, you know, product designer, product, specialist um started you know kind of pushing for adding more products to this line you know it started with just uh, simple patch cables and things like that um and then we started adding things like the uh hopscotch which is you know uh sort of like a different kind of take on the the stackables type cables that a lot of people use where you can take one output and then you can go to several different modules. I won't pretend to explain how modular synthesis <laughs> works because I have no idea. I only, only you just turn knobs and you just plug things yeah. in until it sounds <laughs> as weird as you think it, it. it makes different bleeps and bloops and bops and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, we kind of offered like a different design that was, you know, different enough that it had some, I suppose, like advantages and disadvantages, depending on, you know, what you wanted from like other things on the market that were like that. Uh, then we introduced the knuckle bones, which is a passive malt. Um, so instead of having to have a, a unit on your modular for multiplying uh, signals, which some people have, but I'm sure that you've probably seen with a lot of people's setups, not only are modules expensive, but then ec- economics of space is a big thing too. So if you put a multiple unit in your uh, rack, it may be active, which is good, but it's going to take up a bunch of space from potentially another, you know, module that you can make yeah. beeps and bloops and stuff like that. So <laughs> the knuckle bones was kind of like uh, an interesting design that we came up with. Uh, some people called it like a check hedgehog, like the little, you know, things that they would put on the beach, like in world war two to, yeah, stuff like the ships yeah. <laughs> and, and it's you know kind of modeled after the game jacks actually if you get a 10 pack it comes with a rubber ball in there to kind of like emulate oh, nice. a game of jacks um and uh so that's a one to five passive malt so you can plug one module into it and then you have five outputs that you can patch to 
all different modules. Um, and uh, then we came out with the uh, monkey bars, which is a cable holder, but you can use it in multiple different ways. It can be, uh, it has holes on the top, it has holes on the back so that you can put it up against something, you can put it underneath a table or a desk, and then it also has a uh, an extension on the back of it so that on a like a microphone stand or a pole or anything you could um, screw it to and it will stay there. So it's meant to kind of be this like doesn't have to be in one place. You can move it around and use it in all these different ways. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we want to buy some modular synths <laughs> in my basement just make... like because you can't buy one because no. you got to hook it it's into a, something no. it's like a bad habit it's yeah. like pedals you yeah know, for your guitar you know i have a friend like... who's really into it and he said do not buy any of this stuff until you make an actual plan <laughs> because you will go broke and so i've tried to you know with my gear acquisition syndrome i'm like just stay away from that little world because it's too easy to uh you know you know oh, how yeah we, you know how we do thank you bob yeah. Or, uh, you know, yeah. awesome. starting this. Well, there's, there's uh, a total wormhole you can fall into with that. There is. So, I want to ask you another question here um, that's not business related. Uh, do you have a favorite t shirt? And if so, uh, what does it say on it? My favorite t shirt? Um, I think I do. It's just black and it says Bubba's in. And it has a pig bartender with a mustache on it. Nice. Now, it just fits. It fits my torso just perfectly for whatever reason. But I got it because I used to help a friend who sold vintage clothing, like take pictures for when he would post it on eBay and stuff like that. And just for helping, like he gave it to me because it, it was out here in Los Angeles and that bar Bubba's Inn apparently was in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Ah. So it says Oshkosh on it. So he gave it to me, and uh, it's probably the T-shirt that I I nice. wear the most whenever it's clean. Isn't it funny as you get older? Like it's not as important what's on the T-shirt; it's how it fits over your torso, like how yeah. it makes you look aesthetically. Yeah, know, for sure. I, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I, I have I have way too many T-shirts. My my wife will attest that she's like, "Can you get rid of some of these things?" But <laughs> it's like a journey. It's like you know, flipping through your old CD wallets. You know, of like, ah, oh, you know, I yeah, remember that time concert. I remember that, and and it feels real good to go to my children and be like, "This T-shirt is older than you." <laughs> we need to make <laughs> some, we need to make some uh, what the tech T-shirts. What the tech T-shirts like in the metal. You know, yes. the logo. Okay. Like the ones you can't read, you know, <laughs> it's just super metal. I like Make it. it super black metal where it just is yeah, like exactly. lines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, community, right, is a big part of the theme, I think, from Hosa Tech as a manufacturer that makes you different than other companies. And uh, part of that community is I know you volunteer at Katarina's Club, and mm -hmm. uh, Hosa does things like audio engineering, scholarships, and Pastathon, Pasta. where um, you're raising money and helping uh, different organizations. What are you guys up to right now as far as some of those promotions and some of those things that you're doing for the community? Uh, it's all the same stuff that we've uh, been doing because, uh, like I said, we've we've been lucky enough to, you know, adapt to this changing world this year and uh, to be still here and uh, philanthropic philanthropic uh, efforts have always been really important to uh, Mayumi since uh, she came around and it, they don't always have to do with music. You know, it's just about being involved. So you mentioned Katarina's club, um, which is, you know, where sort of the pasta thon comes from. So hungry kids in our areas, you know, that don't have a hot meal uh, Katarina's club uh, through uh, chef uh, Bruno Serrato, um give out hot meals for free to people in the community um and even now during covid times you know he's never stopped even when his restaurant got closed down he still uh continued to That's make amazing. food and yeah. serve it and uh, we've donated you know money to that cause but also uh every year maybe you know, obviously it's complicated this year so we haven't been able to do it the same way but uh, we would raise uh like 
we would have a contest in our office so that all the employees would get involved and we would go out and we would buy pasta and we would buy sauces and all the things that we would donate. Um, and then whatever, you know, winning team would get, you know, the company would pay for lunch for them or, you know, something, something like that. They incentivize it, but it gets everybody involved so that we're not just the companies giving money, but all of the employees are personally involved in it, uh, as well. Um, so we, can I ask, can we get in on that somehow? Can we send like a case of, of rigatoni or something the next time you do it? Can you let us know so we can get involved in that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That would awesome. be cool. I mean, you can address it to me so that it can count towards my well, uh, totals. <laughs> yeah, that works. She's going to be on behalf of, you know. So. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, like I said, this year is kind of weird. So we haven't had everybody like in the office because I'm, yeah. I'm working from home uh, to be able to like bring everything in. But we still are we still are collecting money and we have like a little thing out in the office for anybody who comes in. So uh, still trying to keep that you know, kind of going, even though it's been a bit of an off year, but uh, trying to support what they're doing because they haven't stopped and it's, it's inspiring and it's important and it obviously affects our community. So it means something to us. Um, one thing that we probably are the most involved with is uh, an organization called the uh, Corazon de Vida and they support uh, orphanages in Baja, Mexico, uh, because in Mexico there, there are no uh, to, to my understanding, there are no uh, state or government services that provide support to orphanages and like abandoned kids. Um, so this organization uh, collects money, collects uh, items um, and support for all these private orphanages because they're all private run, privately funded. Uh, so we're involved heavily with them as far as fundraising, giving money. Um, and before COVID, uh, we would sometimes send people down there as like volunteers in order to like uh, spend a day at the orphanage and spend a day with the kids. You know, you play games, you kick around the soccer ball and do anything to kind of like bring a little bit of, you know, joy, joy and life into, you know, some of these kids because uh, they're, they're great kids. But as you can imagine, it's it's not exactly the ideal circumstance for them to be in. So it, it certainly means something when you show up, but uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I looked it up and I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I'm glad that you said it <laughs> and not me because it sounded so eloquent and, and fluent. And I think I would have pretty much uh, ruined the pronunciation of that. So that's an amazing so, cause that you guys are part of. And again, you know, if you haven't figured this out yet, HOSA is, you know, a very great organization that's focused on community. Yeah, I actually really, we, you know, every year at, at NAM, unfortunately this year, we won't be able to get to do this, but we always have uh, a very early rep meeting <laughs> with, with Hosa. Um, but there are great <laughs> breakfast meets. You can't complain. Good breakfast. Um, good yes. breakfast. But um, it's, it's really cool actually to hear what you guys are doing for the community every year. Cause that's a, that's always part of the meeting, which is, which is awesome. Cause it really just does show that you guys are really truly about your community that you're in, whether it's the, you know, the music community or your local community. And that, that's really awesome yeah. to see that in a vendor. So Bravo. Bravo. Well, we're a small, small company. And we're a family run business and yeah. we, we feel, even though lots of people would think that we're big cause they see us everywhere. We feel small, you know, because we we're in a building with less than 40 people that work there and yeah. the company treats everybody really well. They treat you like family. Lots of people have been there for years. I mean, I've combined about eight years total now of working for HOSA. Um, and many people that work there have been there much longer than I have. Uh, so it has that kind of culture and they cultivate it and they appreciate it. And this is just like, it's part of that, um, which is, I think w one of the things that I love most about, you know, the company is it, some companies try and tell you all about family and stuff like that, but you know, that they're, they're big, you know, and they, they've, they've bought out other companies or whatnot. It's just, you know, for Hosa, it is just Hosa and the same thing that we've been doing since 1984. Cool. Love it. Sorry. I had to go plug in this computer. It was about to run out of batteries. 
It's always something with us. Okay. You know? I'm used to people walking away when I start. Like, that's, why our, that's why our show is called What the Tech, because we're always like, <laughs> we okay. don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, wait, uh, is this recording? This, I hope. <laughs> so, um, so, Dylan, we do have another Pod Dex question for you. Would you rather have unlimited sushi for life or unlimited tacos for life? Does this mean that you can only eat, like, yep. this is all you eat all, right. all the time? Or is it just that you have access to unlimited tacos or sushi? I think it's like you can eat one or the one or the other unlimitedly forever. You, you, don't, you can eat other stuff, but you can't, like, if you pick tacos, you can't have any sushi. Okay, it's an either or application. Ah, okay. Well, if that's the case that I don't have to just exclusively eat one thing, I would go with sushi because I think the best sushi is better than the best taco. Oh, I would I would agree with you. I'm not a huge taco fan. I See, mean, I like the tacos, but technically you can have like fish tacos. Is that like sushi taco? Mm. I don't know. What they're, if you had a sushi burrito? <laughs> Ooh, sushi burrito. They have those. They, they do. They they do. Have, some Japanese places do do make those, or like I should say, kind of you know what do they call it? Uh, hybrid or you know. But here's the thing: fusion. you're not thinking about is fusion. the taco is basically a burrito is basically an ancho like you can tortilla have a meat more... vegetables and cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, all it's it is. just really. I mean, like if you crunch up a taco, you got taco salad. You know, if you. I don't know. I'm just thinking I'm, outside of the box. Here. I'm going to stick the Japanese route and go with the, okay. the sushi. Wait, isn't uh, isn't um, octopus called taco in Japanese? I think. Is it? I think so. Don't quote me. We're going to have to fact check. We're going to have to fact check. It might be. It's kind of just like red beard. You know, like. Hey Siri. What is octopus in Japanese? In Japanese, octopus is taco. Yay! <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Siri. I'm trying to be nicer to Siri. She's always uh, most, <laughs> most of the time helpful, but when she's not, I'm very rude to her. So thank it's, you. We are now going to have to mute that in the feed because everyone's phones are going to be like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what are, what are you, what's going on? That's a culture. Well, the only reason I right remember there. taco, uh, I, I ate at a restaurant in Pittsburgh. I think it was Pittsburgh that was called taco. And you had sushi. They had sushi, but they also served tacos. But oh, okay. so, it was kind of a whole fusion thing. And all but. the waiters were octopuses. <laughs> yeah, was, they had octopus tacos. That would be the perfect synergistic yeah. meeting between the two. Yeah. So um, we're going to pause because the phone is ringing. But, um, you know, it is the season, uh, you know, stocking stuffers. We all need stocking mm -hmm. stuffers. So. We all have the audio files and the musicians and you know, content the, creators, the content and creators and the techie people in our, our life. So what are your top stocking stuffers from how is it this year? Uh, I mean, I think one thing is we're talking about stockings. Uh, I think cable ties is always like a must Ooh, because you always need those way more than you, they're the thing you never think about. But then once you have them, you're like, I need more of these in my life. I always uh, have a pack in my my mix box just in case. Yeah, but you're an anomaly because you have one of everything well, in that, that box. That, that's true. But you know, you never know when you might need to to wrap some things. Yeah. Even if it's just making something look nice on stage that you know you just want to bundle things, you know. Cable All right, box. that's a great Absolutely. answer. What's number two? Uh Gobi Labs uh equipment care kit. Uh so little two ounce bottles. You can travel with those when you have, you know, when when gigs were a thing and they probably <laughs> will be in the future probably. Uh, but comes with microphone sanitizer, screen cleaner and uh, headphone cleaner, you know, things that everybody at some point or another pretty much uses. Um, Actually, I would be willing to guess there's a lot of people that aren't cleaning their instruments. So now that you're not out playing shows, maybe take a little time and clean up that <laughs> spend so much on <laughs> clean off your, your ear goo off your headphones and uh, just spend a little time keeping it clean. Yeah. No, I made I made some really really terrible quarantine videos uh, <laughs> along those same lines some months ago, uh, about just trying to motivate yourself to just do just just do a little bit. And I think it was like the primary thing was the headphone cleaner. Like, can you just at least like just wipe your headphone down? Yes, it's the least you could do. You know, yes. I'm not asking <laughs> you to pick up your laundry, <laughs> uh, but uh, 
Yeah. All right. So, so cleaning. So Gobi cleaning. Yep. And uh, number three. Uh, well, we brought it up, I think, before, and I think it makes sense for everybody. But uh, edge cables, especially if it's a stocking, if it's a gift you're giving somebody, because I think we all know that, the, it, as you alluded to before, uh, cables are not the sexy part of your setup. So you don't tend to invest in them a whole lot. So maybe, you know, you do a nice thing and you gift somebody else something that they may not, uh, you know, get for themselves. Uh, so like, like edge... socks, you know, like we all need exactly. a nice new pair of socks, but when you open up the socks, you're like, I just don't buy myself socks. So give somebody, sure. I don't want to call them the socks of the audio industry, but give somebody a nice cable to upgrade whatever they're doing. <laughs> but that, you know, that cable is essential with, you know, without that cable, the microphone's not going to do anything. That's that, true. that flying V is not going to do anything. That's true. Exactly. And it's like you mentioned before, you know, you spend all this money on gear you, you buy a $2,000 guitar, you buy a $3,000 amplifier, and then you buy a $5 cable to plug it all into that, yeah. you know, that is gonna, you at that yeah, gig, yeah. you know, it's right before start, showtime. <laughs> and it's going to start sucking your tone and everything. So, you know, you may as well, if you're going to go that far, you know, invest in, I don't know, a little bit, a little more. Um, you deserve it, right? Exactly. You deserve it. Treat yourself. Treat pamper, yourself. pamper yourself. Yeah. I love it. All right. What's number four, Dylan? Um, USB C cables that we just came out with. Uh, those are. I have them in my bag. Yep. yep. They're I love them. becoming more and more prevalent. Laptops, gaming devices, phones. Um, so so. It, it's a good thing to just have extra lying around. I mean, in my place now, I have uh, USB cables like everywhere to the point where like if I walk into a room, I don't want to have to drag a cable with me. It's like already sticking on the wall, ready for me to plug my phone in or whatever. Do you know what the best part of those USB-C cables are? Is they're freaking long. Oh yeah, they're, they are long. You know, long gone are the days of that one foot cable that you're like, man, yeah. what, what can I do with yeah, this? Let me get here? some distance. <laughs> it's kind of like when you were, you know, back in the day when you had a phone with a cable, yeah. you had to get the long, that long twisty cable so you yep. could go outside of the room and hide in the closet so your parents <laughs> couldn't hear you talking to your, your girlfriend in sixth grade. <laughs> it's kind of like that, but it's really not. It's really not. It's just all about charging your device. But you yeah, know, Sean's I, been raving about those USB-C. I love them. Like, every time I talk to him, he's like, we got to do video on the USB-C cable. They're so awesome. I'm glad you brought that up. And finally, number five. Uh, I would say pro interconnects because huh? if you're doing audio, even if you're just like doing a little recording at home, chances are you're probably using a pair of speakers. Mm -hmm. Chances are you're using an audio interface and the chances are you're probably just using the cheapest cable that you could find to connect that interface to your speakers. And, uh, I will say out of all the things that I've ever sent to artists or talk to them about and you know i send them they, they check out edge or they they have good things to say it the the thing that they notice the most immediate difference for is the interconnect going from the um uh, interface to their speakers like immediately they're just like it's clear there's more volume there's less noise uh because when it comes to instrument cables uh I mean, the build of it, of course, matters, but we start talking about like really small, nuanced, small percentage differences between, you know, when you start going up and up. And as you start going up further, those percentages get smaller and smaller as, as far as like the differences that you could hear or feel. But with Pro Interconnects, uh, I mean, if you're mixing, if you're recording, you know, you want to have the best uh, replication of the audio that's coming out of your interface and into your speakers, um, rather than something that's going to have a whole bunch of noise and, uh, is going to be a bit muffled or just affected in a way that's going to change the way that you listen and mix, which is going to change the way that somebody else is going to hear it on their speakers or earbuds or whatever. So, right. You know, I also like to mention this too, with pro cables, you know, People need, you know, we've, we've become such a disposable nation of toss it away when it's done. And, you know, the pro cables, the edge cables, they're all serviceable. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you need to learn the ancient art of soldering if you need to repair. But that is something that every 
techie musician everyone should know how to do don't let that die but um you know your cable lives on it's, it's you know to me that's awesome you know, that is yeah. important, but I will mention that all of our cables do come with a lifetime warranty. So that is true. If anything goes lifetime sour warranty. on you, send us an email and we'll send you out a replacement. See, because Hosa cares about the community. I keep Maybe. telling you this, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dylan, this was awesome. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on What the Tech. I feel like I got to know you even more than I already knew you, and I'm glad we get to share this message about Hosa. If you're interested in finding out more about, about Hosa Tech, just go to hostatech.com or you can visit audiobiz.com if you're looking for a demo of a product or where you want to buy your next great cable. So until the next time, uh, we'll see you on uh, What the Tech. Yeah. And Dylan, next time you're back in Wisconsin, give us a call and we'll do shot skis or something. You know, like, you know, we'll have, have a good old time. <laughs> cool, man. I'll be back later this month. So All right. maybe then. Exactly. We will see you very soon then. All right. Thanks All a lot. Right, later, guys. Thank you.